actually starts a little bit sooner. Your text doesn't have a whole lot on this. It's really a new requirement. And in essence, it's in the evolutionary stages for the permitting process. In essence, what we're trying to do here is to provide lateral support to buildings. And what do we primarily do lateral support for? This diagram right here kind of explains it, wind direction. Now, for us, we primarily have a west wind, but not always. The wind can swirl and come from any direction. These were all really kind of set up due to the Missouri River Valley, where the tor what we call Tornado Alley. They, and they started doing this. Now, certainly, do you see any buildings getting blown down in Twin Falls? They're very, very rare, and certainly no new ones. I have seen us get little microbursts that come through and knock down a barn that's 150 years old or something like that. So I don't know if it's applicable to us, but whether it is or not, our permit groups are requiring it, so you must do this drawing. Now, like I said, it's in an evolutionary stage in that many drafters out there are supplying this information on a floor plan with a couple symbols. I think it's getting complex enough now, it needs its own drawing, and so therefore we're gonna produce our own sheet on it. It can be a small drawing, they buy that, you can go eighth inch on this. In fact, I would recommend that you do go eighth inch. A good place for it to go would be right after your floor plans, or if you have room on your second floor floor plan to put an eighth inch drawing of it, then you can go ahead and do it. Now, you have to do all floors. Where is our first floor? Not our main floor, but our first floor, what we consider the lower floor. It's in the basement, it's underground. Is it gonna blow over? Mm. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, and in fact, it's a concrete wall. There is no way we're getting a wind to blow over a daylight basement home. No way, it would might take the top floor off, but it's leaving that bottom floor. Now with that, I did not give you one note that I would like you to include for your basement. The thing that will hold it up. Okay, so here, I'm going to pull this drawing up real quick. Here is the section of your basement wall. And I don't, it will be on the deal, but in essence, I want this note on it and sizing to go with it. Okay. Now, this was mirrored in the wrong spot. Let me, let me do something real quick here. I need to do a mirror on this. Ah. So when you draw, what I'd like to see is a hidden line. And let me kind of, I'll come in and show you the elements of it here. Oh wait, no, I had that right. Sorry, that's sitting there doing something else. Okay. Now, let me just kind of come in and show you the elements. Okay, so right here, so you take your concrete wall. Here's my concrete wall. You should have an offset at two inches, and you should have a hidden line that runs top to bottom in this wall. That's going to represent your vertical rebar. Now, it should be two inches from this inside wall, because where is the pressure that's getting placed on this concrete wall? It's this soil right here, right? This is all soil pushing this way. Remember, the rebar is for tensile strength. So when we're pushing on it, this half of this wall is in compression, this half is in tension. You want to make sure your rebar is in the tension side of the wall. Okay. So I put it two inches. Okay. Then use the donut command and put your horizontal rebar. When I say vertical rebar, that's the stuff running straight up and down. Horizontal is running this way through the wall. Use the donut command. And on a nine foot wall, you need to have three of them. Okay, so I've got one here. That one is 12 inches from the top. Because it's also got to be within 12 inches of the top and bottom. Okay, so you have one at the top. You have one within 12 inches of the bottom. And then you have one in the middle. That's what you're required for a nine foot concrete wall. And then here's the note that you'll attach to it. So three number four rebar, horizontal, 
The top and bottom will be within 12 inches of the top and bottom of the wall. The other one's going to be mid. Your verts have to go 24 inches on center. Do we have to show all three? Yep, show all three. And place this note on it. This will be in your full section. The one we did the day before we left, right? And that will take care of the structural items of that concrete wall. Okay, you good on that? All right, other than that, we do not have to do any shear on that. Now, your text just kind of gives us a little bit of short rift because it was just kind of coming out when this text was kind of put together. And so therefore, I gave you a handout this morning, this thing right here. It's double-sided. This is actually copied out of the IRC, and it's section 602.10. So chapter 6, section 210. This has braced wall panels. Brace wall panels are how we control the wind and how it blows against the structure. Okay. Now I want to give you a couple pictures of what is a brace wall panel. A brace wall panel is something that is meant to withstand this wind force so things don't tip over. Now this is typical wall construction for us right here where we have a 2 by 6 stud, 16 inches on center. Now these are only nailed on the top and bottom through the bottoms. And if you've ever seen anything where I have a vertical member and a flat member and I nail this way, I can push it over real easy. Okay. And so it, it, it's there for your loads pushing straight down. It's not there for pushing your loads this way. What we do in our country is we put this piece of OSB on the outside. And then we nail it on the back side of this and that piece right there gives us our lateral support. We call these things for the shear panel or the brace wall panels, we call them WSP for wood structural panel. Now you'll notice on most walls, since this is an eight foot sheet and our walls are really eight foot one and an eighth at a minimum, right? And if we do a nine foot wall, it's nine foot one at a minimum. This thing won't cover the entire wall. The problem we get is the seam that comes right here. Because for this 8-foot sheet to act unilaterally, we have to nail it 8 inches on center to put enough steel in it so that when it starts to turn, it holds the board efficiently. Well, I've got 16 inches from here to here, and I can't nail it at 8 inches along here. So we pointed this out in that house over by our lot where they came in and blocked in between here. Remember that? Mm -hmm. They put a piece of blocking in here so that they could nail along this seam and make these two boards act as one. Do you guys remember that? I said take a picture of it. Did anybody get a picture of that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would somebody want to take a I don't have an exact picture of that. Would you mind downloading it to get Google Classroom sometime today and just say shear structural panel? That's the only thing we're going to do different for us is we're going to add a board in here so that I can nail this seam. Because I have to nail it eight inches on center. So that is your structural panel. Now I did grab... So what you were talking about wasn't on that picture. What's not that? This picture, no. It wasn't on that picture. No, it was not on that picture. It's on, it's on this one. Um, I'm going to try and find one here on the internet. They, they give lots of pictures, but I'm not... Uh, here might be one. No, this isn't no. one either. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to try and find a picture. Yep, that's it right there. Mm -hmm. That one's not one either. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, maybe um, since I can't find one on the internet, maybe we'll just circle around with and bring back your memories from Cheryl's. <laughs> and I'll put it on the computer book costume. It's very self explanatory. Okay. So in essence, what we have to do is we have to specify where those things go. Now, where do they go? The design criteria is laid out in this pamphlet. And I want to hit some high spots of this. So I'm going to start on the first page, which is 165. And I've, just got, I've got some of these highlighted, so we're not going to go over every one of these. But if you ever did residential design, it would benefit you to go through this with a fine tooth comb. Okay. So the first one I want to hit is 10.22, location of brace wall panels. Okay. Um, what this states is that when you do a brace wall panel, the brace wall panel shall begin within 10 feet from each end of a brace wall line. And part of it's blacked out right there. Yeah. That is from each end. That's got blacked out. Somebody hit it with a, probably me. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't gotten a clean copy of this. Okay, so it says, brace wall panel shall begin within 10 feet from each end of a brace wall line. And then the second part that I've got highlighted here. The distance between adjacent panels along a wall line shall be no greater than 20 feet. Now what does that mean? I'm going to look at my floor plan here. Let me turn off my dimensions and just kind of give you a quick scenario of it. So first off, what that says is, I have to have a brace wall panel. Now, for now, think 48 inches of wall space. Within, and it's uninter uninterrupted wall space. Doors and windows interrupt that wall space. So what it's saying is, if I come from a corner, this would be a brace wall line. Right here, this wall. I, within the first 10 feet, I have to have a panel here. From this corner. Within 10 feet, I have to have a panel of that corner. Then from one panel to the next panel, I can't have more than 20 feet. So let me look at this. This is a much longer wall. So I have to have one within 10 feet of the corner. Then I'm going to have to have one kind of mid-span in here, but it's got to be from the edge of this one to the starting edge of the next one. Can't be greater than 20 feet. And then I set them accordingly. So that's what that's telling us right now. When we look at a braced wall line, you're looking at a linear wall. Like this, like this, like this. And we're talking exteriors for the most part. Twin Falls City has not brought the interiors into this scenario yet, but they're going to. Yes? So question, you put OS, they put OSB around the entire house anyway, so you're basically taking, you just have to brace, you just have to put that bracing. Yep. yep, you just have to do it in certain parts. Okay. Those little extra blocks and nail that one a little bit different. Because normally we nail them 16 inches on center. Yeah. When I'm doing a brace wall panel, I double the nails that I'm putting in it, and I have to get all edges. Okay? So you've got OSB on the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. But we need to kind of take every once in a while and make one a little stronger. Okay? So that's what that code is telling you right there. So let's turn the page to page 166. We're going to look at 10.2.3. Here's the area I have highlighted. Minimum number of brace wall panels. Brace wall lines with a length of 16 feet or less shall have a minimum of two wall two brace wall panels of any length, or one brace wall panel equal to 48 inches. Brace wall lines greater than 16 feet in length shall have a minimum of two panels regardless of size. 
That's important for us, but it's kind of nice. If I have you know, a little bump out all the time, we get those, and I'm 16 feet or less, I can put one brace wall panel in it, and I can put it anywhere in that wall. Anywhere, just one. As long as I can get 48 inches. We'll talk about the different sizes here in a minute. We do have applicable adjustment factors. Remember, when, I talk to, when you talk about codes, always look for these exceptions because they're going to allow you to design around them. Number two is the best one. So in seismic design category C, that's us, a low risk for earthquake. Now California would be a D, Alaska would be a D, we're C. We, we can do adjustment factors. By that we can get less, okay? because we don't have a lot of shaking. So that gives the table number. We're going to be in this table in a minute. Okay, that table that we're talking about is just coming up. Now, how do you read this table? I'm only going to deal with the top and then one category of it. So over here, you have wind speed. This is on our website. We have to use 90 miles or less. Now this section right here is for 85 miles an hour wind speed or less. You can't use any of this info. Okay. You'll notice right down below it is a 91 down here that I don't have shown on the video. Okay. Now this is story location. This will be applicable for you if you're going multiple stories. But this one is for one story with a roof only. That's what we're using because really the basement's not going to be considered in this it's underground. If I'm doing a two-story structure, I have to do it with this one for the main floor, and then I have to move to this one for the second floor. If I had a third floor, I would go to this one. Okay. So this, this chart right here works for one, two, or three floors. So if I'm doing a single floor, I use this. If I'm using a two floor and I'm dealing with the top floor, I use this. If I've got a three, I use this for the third floor of my third. How, now, how you do? Now, let's change. Now, let me. Before you ask any questions, why that works? Go to the next classification. Notice I've gotten rid of this one. Here. So here, I, this would be the first floor of my second story. Remember that one right there that was unused? I now use all these numbers for this. This is good for the second floor of a three-floor structure. I use these numbers. These numbers are going to get more restricted because the lower you, closer you get to the ground, the more shear we have. And then they've gotten rid of this one, this one, this is the first floor of the third floor structure. I use these. You have to do every floor that's above ground unless it's concrete. Okay. That's how you use these charts. So if I'm doing the second floor of a three-story structure, I would come to this one. I would look at my braced wall line. You must round up. Let's say I was 40 feet, and then I'm using method WSP. It would tell me I have to have 12.5 feet of braced wall panel in that wall line. Now, where you put them, then it's guidelined. I got to have one within 10 feet of a corner. I need 20 feet in between them, or no greater than 20. And I should start putting them in there until I get greater than 12.5 linear feet. Right. What's the difference between CSWSP or WSP? We'll get into the methods here in just a moment. So you are using this chart. And we're going to get into this chart here greater than 90. And the only thing we're using is this one for our structure, this guy right here. Because we're really one floor supporting a roof. Now, did that answer all those questions that I first saw starting to pop up? Well, we're going to use that here in just a moment. Now, there's several pages of these charts. Um, go ahead and turn them. And let's go to page 173. Here are your bracing methods. So, Lisa, this is that question you were just starting to ask with WSP. Okay, here you go. We have three types used in our area. The LID, lead-in bracing, we use this here. 
They give you a picture of it right here. Now, when you do lead in bracing, most of the time we do this with two by fours. What we do, it's a piece of angle iron, and what it's galvanized, and I think it's 16 gauge. And what a framer will do is they'll build the wall while it's laying on the ground, right, before they tilt it up. And they'll snap a chalk line, and they'll set their saw to like an inch deep, and they'll just cut a little gouge in it, stick the piece of angle iron in there, and then nail it. Okay. And so this piece of metal, it goes right here, it's nailed on that stud, that stud, that stud, that stud, and down on the bottom plate. And it acts to keep that thing from tilting. We do use this sometimes in our country. So LID framing. You never got to see an example of it while we were out in the field. We didn't see one. It's getting rarer and rarer all the time. And it's because this one we do anyway. So most people just adopt this one. It's called wood structural panel. Has to be greater than 3 8 Our OSB is 7 16 which is greater than 3 8 okay. So we just we got to do ours for insulation anyway. Let's just go ahead and make it a shear panel. So here they just kind of show you coming all the way up. Remember, we don't want windows or doors in this space if we can keep, keep that from happening. Okay. The nailing is over there. I think I said eight inches. Did I get that wrong? What's the nailing on that? On WSP, six inches on the edges, 12 inches in the field. Okay. So I did have that wrong. So to show you my memory is not perfect. The other one we see quite often is down at the bottom, ADW, or an alternate brace wall panel. Now the ADW, this one doesn't really give you a whole lot, but what they're doing is they're recognizing this OSB. And it actually goes to the next page. And this one we see a ton of. Okay, and these are all alternate bra brace wall panels. And I've highlighted the top three here. You have portal PFH, PFG, CSWSP. You see this with garages. Because in garages, what do we do? We build a wall with a huge opening in there. And many times those openings are 16, 20 feet wide, right? So how do we get braced wall panels in there? And also, if I'm doing a 20-foot wide garage and I put a 16-foot door in there, do I have enough room to put a 4-foot panel in there? No. No, I don't. Okay, then we do PFH, which is a portal frame with a hold down. Okay. Now, you did see some of these. Remember when I pointed out that, hey, look for that metal strap coming out of the concrete? Um, let me see if I've got it. I might have a picture of one of those. Let me see if I do. Um, I think I do. I just got to get the right angle on the picture I took. Now it doesn't have it. I know we took some pictures of them when you were. What's this picture got? This one's got them, but you can't see them. The OSB is over the top of it. This one looks like it's got some. Oh, OSB's over the top of it already, too. Okay, here they are. Oh, you can't see that. I'm sitting there talking to the computer, aren't I? <laughs> okay, here you see them here. We're on this structure. These are not four feet. So see these metal straps right here? Most of the time they're on the inside of the wall, so you can't see them, but this is getting bricked over, so they are left on the outside. But this goes down into the footing and then has a curl underneath it where it's wrapped around the rebar. And then this strap comes up. It's real thick stuff. It's eight to a quarter inch thick. And then we put nails all through here. And that holds that from moving. Okay. This is what we do a lot around garages. Remember seeing those now? When we went and walked around and constructed houses? Well, what's so, the difference between a PFH and a PFG? Okay. But we'll get to that. Okay. Okay. Now that's what happens if you get less than two foot eight on a shear wall panel, you have to go to hold downs. That's the magic number. 
two foot eight. Okay, PFG. You'll want to read on this one. This is really where people are starting to go to now. So this one kind of shows that we've got a little bit different scenario in that I now have a blank wall. So what I can do is do shear panels on both sides, but what the, you have to go to another area of the code to do it, but the beam that goes across here has to be constant. So most of the times we'll put a beam that only goes to about, yeah, let me zoom that, bring that up so I can draw on it correctly. Okay, so most, if I'm using a PFH, my beam can stop right here, as long as I got a column to hold it up, right? Mm -hmm. But with a PFG, what we're gonna try and do is get away from hold downs, because they, they're hard to do. So what we then do is we take this header on the top and we have to run it continuous through all of our shear panels on both sides. So we control it with the header. Okay, which means that your big header up there, which is a fairly expensive piece, you're buying more linear feet up there. Why are those hold downs hard to do? What's that? Why are those metal straps hard? Don't you just pluck them in the concrete? And you do pluck them in. It's really the coordination on them to oh. get, them, get them done correctly is the, is the struggle. So yeah. if you're doing a, a garage that it's two singles with a post in between, then it's going to go all the way across both of them? Yes, it would. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, keep in mind, folks, when we're doing this, if you don't get any, you stay within any of these guidelines, you do not have to get the thing engineered. If a